this is the first time that the film festival is really getting into um, having conversations about caring for each other. And I'm really excited because, you know, in, in our industry, it feels like there was one kind of dominant narrative always and kind of a dominant audience. And as people are, you know, becoming more drawn into um, independent film and uh, making film is becoming more accessible in a lot of ways. I work with students and I always tell them they have the power to be um, a, a director of, of a film as if they have a phone in their pocket, you know, so as all all of that is becoming um, more accessible. We want to also talk about how we can just do better. And I'm really proud to have Caitlin Ryan part of our as part of our staff because we're just always kind of just just thinking about how can we treat our staff better? How can we treat filmmakers better? How can we treat guests and audiences better? And we're not really going to get there if we don't start really having some serious conversations um, about this uh, in public. So I'm so happy that you all are here. Um, and I want to introduce uh, Caitlin to introduce uh, today's panelists. Thank you. I'm gonna keep it very brief. Number one, I wasn't prepared. Number two, it's definitely not about me. Um, this is really great. I came to my leadership here at Mill Valley Film Festival when I started this contract this year and I said I wanna do an accessibility panel. I attended this incredible workshop about this incredible piece of information that is now being distributed to all film exhibition events and their managers and filmmakers and everybody involved from the attendance side and the production side. And I said, hey, I want Mill Valley Film Festival to highlight this. Um, and we were able to make it happen. I'm gonna give out like a big thanks to Film Festival Alliance to coming through for us and helping us, you know, not only in the conception of the scorecard, which we're gonna talk about, um, but with taking this recording that's happening now and giving it to everybody who wants to see it complimentary, because that is another form of accessibility, is being able to see and enjoy and view and watch and learn. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Jim Lebrecht, award-winning documentarian and advocate to introduce the panel. And I just wanna say thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Let's try. Oh, there we go. It's always embarrassing when the sound mixer can't get their microphone to work. It's just, and I'm doing that on Zoom all the time. So, well, thank you folks for showing up. Um, let me start from the end and come down. Cassidy Diamond. Uh, uh, I've, I've, I've known Cassidy for a long time for when she was at, um, uh, the International Documentary Association. She's been very, very much involved with um, helping to develop the Accessibility Scorecard, which we'll talk about some more, uh, and the Film Festival Alliance. Wallace, um, so sorry. I didn't know I was going to be doing this. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know yet those glasses. Wallace is from Canine Companions, and she's going to, uh, they're going to talk in a, in a little while about kind of how uh, service um, dogs and such interface with going to festivals. Rosemary, Harita. You're so close. <laughs> I, I've only known you for like seven or eight years, okay? <laughs> but I didn't know I was gonna be introducing people. So anyway, Rosemary's been um, working for a number of years with um, Levant Consulting which uh, managed the um, impact campaign for Crip Camp. And they are really a leading company in working with organizations to really improve their messaging their, their, um, and their accessibility and, uh, and their branding. And, and I think you mentioned I'm, oh, Kibo, Kibo. So Kibo, um, can you introduce yourself first, please? Sure, I'm the Managing Director of Queer Women of Color Media Arts Project, QuackMap, um, and we also run the International Queer Women of Color Film Festival. And I really have to say that your organization really stepped up early to really emphasize um, equity and inclusion, including the disabled community. So uh, if you go to their website, it's freaking awesome. Okay, well, Cassidy, you want to kind of kick this off? Yeah. Uh, hello. Can 
Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, so we're gonna, this is just gonna be a free flowing conversation. Uh, Jim and I have outlined a few things that we just wanna make sure we get to talk about here. Um, I know in some ways we are here to talk about the scorecard, but I think before we get to actually talking about the scorecard, we should get to kind of how we got here and why something like the film event accessibility scorecard is necessary and important. Um, so I think I wanna throw this out to, I think Jim, Rosemary, and Wallace, I think you all can speak in a way um, about why access is important. We're talking about at film festivals and the challenges that folks face when it comes to access. Um, we often talk about the patron experience, but I also think it's important to highlight that film festivals are a place where people do business. Uh, they come here to sell their films, they come here as press, folks are sales agents, and when you are inaccessible, you are also keeping people from being able to do their jobs. Um, and I think, you know, Jim in particular can speak to this, but I would love to hear from the other three pa panelists, um, the, yeah, how lack of accessibility has hindered, uh, hindered you or your community and your friends from being able to have access as a patron, but also as, uh, as a job. Wants to begin? Yeah, who wants to start? Don't all jump at first. <laughs> all right. Would help if I turned it on. Um, my name is Rosemary. I use she, her pronouns. I work with Levant Consulting, Inc. Um, and I think around accessibility, oftentimes people think that they're either making a film for disabled people to watch or they might interact with one other disabled person, but that's it. But the thing about accessibility is if you make it accessible for disabled people, you're making it accessible for everyone. Um, and there are lots of disabled people in the United States. One in four adults in the United States has some kind of disability. And when we think about disability, it's not just people who use wheelchairs. There's lots of different disabilities under the main disability umbrella. and so. What, what about disabled filmmakers or producers, people behind the camera who have stories to tell? And oftentimes we have had to create our own spaces to share our work and our art and our story of our communities because other places have not been accessible. Um, so really thinking outside of the box and getting more creative. And one of the things that I think really stood out to us when we were working on the impact campaign is we had never run an impact campaign before. I didn't know what the heck it was. I didn't know what had been done before. I had no idea that this was even a line of work that I could be involved in. Um, and so Jim and Sarah and Nicole as the the main backers of the film and people who were rooting for us to do this work wanted us to do exactly what we have been doing in the community. And so we did that and it was really successful because we spoke directly to the community because we are a part of the community. And so it's really important to have voices at the table to share their lived experiences and not just think of them as someone that you may interact with, but, but count on interacting with disabled people and not just thinking of it as a last minute I'll fix this and add a ramp situation. Um, so really starting from the very beginning um, and, and considering who is going to be interacting with you and the event or the program that you're putting together. Hi there, I'm Wallace. Uh, I also use she, her pronouns. Um, and just adding on to what Rosemary said, I think there's occasionally this kind of vibe within um, most industries, festivals um, are just as guilty of it as, as most other industries that do interact with disabled people that something is accessible enough and not realizing that accessibility, as you just said, does you know, it doesn't end with a ramp. It doesn't end with an interpreter. And the fact is that whether or not 
Um, you know if you're going to be interacting with someone with a disability, you should be prepared to do so. And with that, it's keeping in mind some of those more universally designed aspects. Why do we need the stairs? Let's just have a ramp for everyone. Um, let's bring an interpreter. And you know what, if the interpreter is just standing there interpreting for the crowd, even though no one knows American Sign Language, you're still doing good because you know the reality is you don't know who might be out there, who's benefiting from it, who doesn't want to come and sit up in the front row and, and say, hello, I'm deaf. Um, and I think that's true in workplaces and behind the scenes as well, is let's think about how we can just make this generally easier and accessible for every single person who is working behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, and uh, as patrons of these types of events. Um, I think that's important to also, I'm gonna talk about service dogs, sorry, we have two back here. Um, you know, considering that venues need to have some place that we can access accessibly to toilet or give our service dogs a break. And that's a, I mean, that's a big thing. You think about going to the, the Oscars or um, these huge film festivals and it's like concrete and security and red carpet. And you think, well, is there a way we can make this easier? Because I can tell you right now, it's like if going from a, a, a stadium to, you know, like the airport security where you have to go back out and, you know, drive a mile and then drive a mile in the other direction so that you can find a place to literally just one foot of dirt for your dog. And I think it's just a consideration that doesn't get brought up quite as much. Um, I don't want to talk too much about service dogs yet. I have my own question on that. But again, just thinking globally about disability is, is really important. This is so good to hear. Um, um, we had the incredible experience of going to the Oscars. Um, uh, so I guess that was, was it uh, April of last year, right? 2020, it's like, what is time at this point? I, <laughs> we don't get it, but we had done uh, Crip Camp, we had worked in communication with the Motion Picture Academy. And it was a really kind of, in one way, a very, very simple uh, mandate. I, I and the other wheelchair users, or folks with disabilities, want to have the same experience as everybody else. Go, all right? And so, and they really met that challenge. It was a little bit easier, because they built a complete kind of facility at Union Station in Los Angeles. But one of the things that'll always stick out in my mind is that someone, so Andrea Levant, who uh, was the leader of our campaign, she has a service dog named Goji. Someone came up to Andrea and said, I'm with the Academy, and if you need somebody to um, walk your dog, I'm here to do that for you. Okay. Who thinks of things like that? And, and so, and my experience and other folks were really that we really could get in anywhere we needed to be. So, um, uh, and you know, and then speaking about ASL interpreters, um, you know, so often at festivals and other gatherings, it's like, well, you got to sit in the front row to be right in front of this person. But yet, at the um, at the Emmys this year, they had a video screen up in the venue uh, that showed the ASL interpreter. So people didn't have to be ghettoized in one specific area. They could sit where they wanted to be. These are kind of, they seem kind of basic now when you think about it, but these are the kinds of things that we're pushing for because it is more than just simply wheelchair accessible bathrooms and parking and such. Um, I want to talk briefly about my experience as a professional over the last couple of number of years in trying to uh, further my career as a sound mixer and sound designer in documentary film. And then when we started working on Crip Camp, um, coming across situations that were um, demeaning at times, um, we had to work very close, or really, I've really worked closely with Sundance for many years to try to improve the, um, the, um, the accessibility there. 
they had a filmmaker's lounge that was up three flights of stairs. And it's like, why do you have that up there? You need to move it someplace. Well, it's a, well, it's not a great location for me. And their attempts at accessibility were not practical. And I was told once, as I was banging on this, oh, well, you know, for those panels up there, we're thinking about having a video feed so you can see what's going on. Completely discounting the fact that here I am, somebody with decades of experience in documentary and, and independent film, and that people should benefit from my being in the room. So completely discounting that. So, I mean, long story short with Sundance, they eventually put, uh, were able to get an elevator into that building so that we could, I could get up to the filmmaker's lounge and for a panel, and that day I went up for the panel, the, uh, the door got stuck at the top, <laughs> which is like, you know, but obviously I got out. <laughs> um, and, so, and let me just say one of the things you really po uh, pointed this out, Cassidy. When I'm going to a festival, yeah, I'd like to see a bunch of films and see old friends, but I'm there to work. And I shouldn't have to try to figure out how to get from point A to point B. I shouldn't have to worry about whether I'm going to be able to find a place to sit. The parties and networking events need to be accessible. One needs to figure out how to support um, deaf and hard of hearing filmmakers who uh, need interpreters. Those folks need to be supported. Um, but I, I just really, and even just, you know, fundraising events for your festival, right? Oh, we've got a, we've got a um, board member's got a great house. We're going to have it there. Well, chances are that place is not accessible. Even if you can get in the front door, probably the bathroom is not accessible. And so when we are excluded for things, it tacitly or not so tacitly says that we don't really matter. But I have to say that accessibility is not optional. And when people think about it right from the beginning and want to do it, things tend to really happen. Um, yeah, I think I, this, yeah, I think this does get us into kind of where Kibo and I can weave into the conversation a bit. And, you know, I think that, Jim, you're, you're, you're right on the mark in saying, like, this has to be thought of from the beginning. Um, I also could go on forever to talk about employment, um, how more folks with disabilities need to be employed at film festivals, because when folks are in the room, it's automatic and that things are being taken into consideration that folks without that lived experience just don't even think about. Um, so just, again, having those fundraising things, making sure your office is accessible, that people can come into your festival offices and work and or have conversations with you. Um, it's a huge part of this. And so, you know, as Jim mentioned, I have long, uh, been seeing what Quapmac is doing around accessibility, um, really taking into the full spectrum of what we're talking about here, going beyond the compliance, going beyond ramps uh, and the occasional ASL interpreter or cart captioning, but really looking at the spectrum of folks and making sure everyone is welcomed, feels safe, and has access to their events. So, Kibo, I know you and I have talked a bit about this, but I would love to hear just kind of how QuackMap got to this point where you are today, to the point where even in a post-lockdown uh, world that we're still in COVID, <laughs> how you were able to pull off an in-person event this year that did not you know, transmit COVID, that made people feel safe, that maybe hadn't been able to leave their homes in a very long time and where you got in accessibility in the first place, because I think a lot of us can learn from what you all are doing. Sure, thank you. Um, I also want to just give a shout out to Caitlin. Um, when I in, ended up having an issue where I can't leave my home today to be there in person with you, Caitlin really made it possible for me to be able to zoom in. And that's an important piece of access is that sort of like backup planning um, and making things happen. So I just really appreciate being able to be here with you in this kind of uh, format <laughs> instead of being there in person. Um, 
And I think that's the thing about what we try to do at QuackMap is also think through, like, what do people need to be able to participate? Um, and that goes from people saying, hey, you know, try this theater. Um, people have tried to get us to go to the Castro Theater for a really long time. And we always said no, because we knew, one, that the bathrooms were really narrow. Two, that there was a um, kind of a mezzanine where all the events were held. There were up a really narrow flight of stairs. So even just in choosing our festival venues, we were paying attention to what made sense for our community. And I think there's another piece here, and that's around employment employment, having disabled people on staff and on your board, um, and also relationships, being in relationship with disabled community. And I will say this about QuackMap, we're a filmmaker-run organization, and so for us, it's like, how can filmmakers get what they need? How can their film be seen by as many people as possible? Uh, and that includes making sure that disabled folks are very much included in what we're doing. Um, and it, sorry, it kind of started very um, gradually because we're a very small organization. We serve queer and trans folks of color um, and really thinking like, well, we don't have money, but what we do have is a commitment. So we would start with small grants here and there. And then we just started basically eating certain costs um, to make sure that it was a possibility. That started with making sure that all of the films had open captions. So that's something we do in-house. That's a part of people's jobs. That's what they do. When people um, submit films to us, they also know that their exhibition cap copy has to be open captioned and that is just a part of everything from the very beginning um, and I think the other piece for us is around cross disability solidarity so even understanding things like people having service dogs and service dogs that are guide dogs being different than service dogs um, for other types of disabilities right and that maybe they don't need to be in the same space, but also understanding that some folks have allergies to dogs, so we need a space for hypoallergenic service animals as well, right? So it's really thinking very broadly, but also very specifically of kind of um, what is not just the vulnerability, but like what are the various needs and then designing everything from there. And I think that's what has pushed us over time to get to the level where we're at right now, which is not only training the filmmakers that we train to include open captions as a part of them learning how to make films, um, but also as we're moving into more audio description, making sure that's a part of our craft as well. Um, we just did a documentary about Jewel Gomez, and we took the transcripts <laughs> from the, you know, the editing process, and we used that to make sure that we would have open captions and then that also formed the baseline for audio description for the film. So really thinking about it craft-wise, I think is what helped push our film festival um, even further. And I'll just leave it there. Yes. <laughs> all the flowers i mean you all really have you know been a road map uh for myself and i feel like others and i think that's what we're also helping hoping that this scorecard can do for folks is to provide not only a chance for folks to give feedback but a, a road map for organizers to look at this scorecard to see the ways that they can start beginning to think at the beginning like kivo said from the inception year out from next year's festival like i know everyone after this wraps is going to be so tired but right as soon as the planning starts for the next one building accessibility in and using that scorecard to see where there might be opportunities to creatively fund things, um, to find sponsors, to find folks that might in, be in the community, individual donors, organizations that might be able to sponsor the, creating open captions for everything that doesn't have them, be, to being able to pay ASL interpreters, uh, even maybe just on demand at first and not at everything, but just at least getting the, the ground running on it. Um, and so the scorecard was really created out of this both necessity that you know jim has spent hundreds of hours of his life i'm guessing as an advocate to just be able to attend festivals to be able to 
see the films that he has made. Um, Jim is a filmmaker. He's obviously an advocate, but I would love for Jim to be able to spend more of his time at a festival being a filmmaker than being an advocate. Um, so this scorecard was made in a lot of ways so that folks can just take 15 minutes of time after attending a festival, folks with disabilities and without, because I would love people that do not identify as having disabilities to start paying attention to accessibility around them because they can take that into other aspects of their lives and also be an advocate and an ally. Um, 15 minutes, fill out this survey. It goes directly to the film festival if they have signed up. That festival now has an incredible amount of data that they can use to improve their festival, but it also is for those organizers who are want to do better and they want to improve their accessibility, but they just don't know where to start or they might be intimidated. As Kibo said, like it, it can be expensive sometimes, but let's let's look beyond the budget, right? Like let's look at what creating equal experiences means and value that. And rather than being intimidated by any kind of price, I'd say, look at these things and say, this is about giving someone the same experience that everyone else gets. It's important and making sure that it is a priority and you will find the funding or you don't, but you make it happen. Like you have to start somewhere and you don't have to do it all at once, right? You don't have to open caption everything, have everything be audio described, have an ASL interpreter at every screening, have live captioning at every screening. Start where you can, right? And that's what the scorecard hopes is that you just start and that year after year, you do more and more and improve and get better. It took QuackMap 10 years to, or so to get where they are now, but look at what they're doing and how open and accessible that festival is to so many more people, where now there are more voices in the room being represented that are adding to the conversation, that are adding to culture, that have been left out because this world has not been built for folks with disabilities, right? Um, and we as festival organizers have the ability to change that and say, this may not have been originally built for you, but we are gonna change that. Um, and so I think that, you know, I don't, I don't know, let's see where we, Jim, I don't know if you wanna yeah. talk a bit about, oh, Kibo, go ahead. Okay. I just wanted to say, I think sometimes we think we're doing something for a disabled community that's not benefiting everyone, which is what Rosemary said. I mean, once we started doing open captions, folks that were elders who were starting to become hard of hearing were like, yes, English language learners um, were like, yes, the open captions benefit me as well. So it's kind of understanding that everyone is benefiting, even if they're not necessarily identifying as disabled, that they're there's a benefit for the entire film festival audience by centering the needs of disabled folks. Yeah, for instance, you know, just practically, you know, these uh, kind of small devices that will uh, that kind of fit into cup holders that have like the words there. Imagine trying to watch a movie where you're looking down here, looking back up, looking back down. Yes, it provides it, but it's not really. Um, um, an enjoyable or a way that people would prefer to do it. I will also say that if you are providing accessibility for films and you advertise it, our community, again, this very broad umbrella, are very, very loyal. And we're also incredibly great online. And if you say, yeah, we're going to be having 10 open caption uh, screenings during our festival, people will show up. It is good business. Oh. I was just going to make a quick comment that those lovely devices Jim was mentioning tend to skip about every other line. Um, and so it's just blank. So you get about half a film when you're using them, whereas open captions, you get 100%. So they're great when in a pinch, but I couldn't tell you half of the movies that I've seen. So good yeah, point. I would I agree with that. And also, most of us are watching, have spent the past couple years at home watching content online. Um, I can guess that at least half of this audience has been watching that content with closed captions on. 
um, because you're either maybe got kids in the other room or, you know, your partner's sleeping and you're sneaking something on your phone or, uh, you know, my I am deaf in my left ear. My partner is a non-native English speaker. We watch everything with captions. I feel like I got a lot of pushback from programmers in the past that said, well, captions, they change the integrity, the integrity of the film or in some, you know, BS like that. And I would say audiences are more prepped than ever to have captions on their films. And we sit and we watch foreign language films with subtitles. Um, it is, to me, not very different to watch something with open captions. And uh, I will second what Kibo said of the kind of moving towards the universal design principle as we are creating things um, that, that things will just trickle down that you didn't even know will be a benefit. Uh, ramps, I mean, I can look if there's anyone in here that works in operations and productions, having a ramp instead of stairs, instead of those three stairs in a venue will help you when you're loading into a venue and bringing in chairs and bringing in tables, like you will have a benefit to your own staff um, that maybe not even identifies as disabled. So working towards that kind of universal design uh, idea and to that end, you know, I would encourage organizers to think of their budgets as moral documents. And we are most film festivals are operate as nonprofits. They're mission driven. They're mission aligned. We hear a lot of talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion these days. Uh, I think the A is often left out of that DEI A conversation of accessibility, and but every festival is a different size. Some of them are very small and don't receive a lot of funding. Some are very large and receive a lot of funding. I don't think there is a number that would be an equitable number, but let's look at the percentage of what you're spending, right? The percentage of what you're spending on access versus the number that you're spending on having 10 parties, right? Do you really need that 10th party? Can that 10th party money maybe go to access to help broaden your audiences and bring more people into the conversation? Um, we haven't even talked about travel and being able to accommodate uh, filmmakers and folks with disabilities. And, um, you know, Wallace has brought their interpreter here today, which I think is is great. I think that we should also be supporting folks that either funding to bring their own interpreter or to be able to have that interpreter that then will follow folks into parties so that they can network and have conversations and be part, not just see the film and hear the conversation and watch and understand the conversation after, but get to go talk in the hallway about what they just saw with the other people that they were just in the, in the, in the theater with. Like, this is what we're talking about. Like the same experience from the moment folks are coming to the festival to the folks that they, the, 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 when they leave. Um, I would, I don't know if you want to, yeah, Rosemary, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was just going to add um, a, few, a few points is thinking about how to include disabled people who are still at home and don't feel safe to be in person um, or for logistical reasons can't make it. There's a lot of benefits to doing hybrid events. Um, and making sure that disabled people, while lots of other people have moved on, dis a lot of disabled people or people who live with other folks who are high risk are still at home. And so how do we not leave us behind and making sure that either the content is recorded and then shared online and captioned or thinking about other ways and being creative. I mean, if we're talking to filmmakers and artists, right, you, you, they're, are tons of ways that you've created things that haven't been done before. So thinking of accessibility as a creative outlet for bringing more people into the conversation. Um, another thing to think about is what, if you don't know where to start, it's okay to just ask people what they need, whether it's on the registration form or on a ticket and you say, we're going to have all of the videos open captioned are there other pieces, are there other accommodations that would make your experience more successful or easier to join, right? And someone says, I need, a, I'm going to bring my service dog, or I use a wheelchair, or I need a quiet space to be able to take a break. Let people tell you what they need without assuming that I'm going to have a ramp and everything will be great. 
and we also have all of the videos open captioned, we've made an effort. Yes, you have made an effort and it is a step in a direction and you don't wanna just spend money on things if you don't know that it's going to actually benefit the people who are attending. And it's okay to ask disabled people. We are used to advocating for ourselves and I would rather someone gently ask me what I need rather than have to go on the website, find a info at random inbox with the hopes that someone actually responds and has an answer about the access question that I have. Instead of doing all of that, just put it on your registration form or just put it somewhere on your website that's not all the way at the bottom that is a statement that says we are committed to access we are committed to this journey and we might not get it right but we need to hear from you on what it is that you need so that you can participate in this space um, and a lot of the work that we do at levant consulting is really just telling people it's okay to say the word disability and it's okay to ask us what we need. And that's a really great start so that you can then build into your budget. Okay, we know that there are five people who need ASL interpreters. How much will that cost? Rather than saying, let's fundraise $10,000 and hope that covers it, right? So working backwards and, and being really strategic about how you're going to integrate access with intention, not just throwing ramps everywhere and hoping that that's going to do the trick. I want to add a couple of things here. When we talk about hybrid now, it isn't just for accessibility for people with disabilities. It's for people who are economically can't afford to come to your festival and uh, or the just people who are geographically disadvantaged. They just or let's even say uh, a single parent who simply can't be out of town. Um, so this serves a broad range of, of, of people. And um, I also want to say a couple of other quick things that I think that what you've been hearing from all of us is that improving accessibility is a process. You're not going to get everything right in, in, immediately, but it is the intention and the, and the learning that you go through year after year that will really make a difference. With our impact campaign for Crip Camp, we, were, we had to shift to online and we had to learn week after week about how to make it more accessible and friendly to different disabilities. But uh, I gotta tell you, we had these summer um, uh, virtual Crip Camps and we started off with about 500 people registered. At the end of the summer, we had 10,000 people all over the world registering to either watch them later on YouTube or dealing with them live. So um, I, I felt like we were really, really successful. I, I do want to say one other quick thing uh, is that two things really fast. First off, I think that folks that are running festivals or programs, you have to look at alternative ways to apply that a online form or written um, uh, application isn't always accessible to certain people mm -hmm. and being open to have somebody do a video or do a conversation to do it will increase the number of people you're providing um, access to and um, shoot oh here's the other one other thing there is so much harm that has been done in media over the years and we all know different communities who have suffered from these negative stereotypes that were perpetrated by people who were not in the community. And we experienced that. I think everybody in this room could probably say, yeah, I know that's true for my community too. But how is that going to change? That's going to change when people are directors and producers and executives uh, and that um, and, and, and then, you know, then you start knocking down the, the harm. But one of the ways for those people to get those jobs is to be on that on that bus at Sundance with somebody. And who are you? Or, you know, or I just met somebody from Apple today. And it's like, great. What do you folks do? So it is that kind of networking that isn't just about, oh, Jim's going to have a job next week. It is about really pushing forward this authentic representation and trying to stop harmful stereotypes. 
Yeah. So I was thinking, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, Cassidy, um, yeah. for, uh, we were going to do some audience questions, sure. maybe, but also there are some folks here from the Marin Center for Independent Living. Um, I have, did not get the opportunity to meet them, but I was thinking maybe <laughs> if, oh, hey, folks, okay. I was just going to give them the mic and like let them talk about yeah. their experience here in Marin specifically, and maybe we can just yeah. uh, center on that a little bit before we go to questions. Thank you. Well, um, thank you. Thank you so much, and really just honoring the leadership of the panelists here, centering on access, centering on people with disabilities and their lived experience. I recall, uh, Eli Gillard, by the way, for Center for Independent Living. Uh, I recall uh, six, seven years ago when Jeremy reached out to me from Mill Valley Film Festival uh, talking about, you know, what can we do to make uh, uh, CFI and Mill Valley more accessible and connecting them with Peter Mendoza from our team. And so to see that conversation and some of the early work that uh, Peter and Jeremy and the festival we're doing to where we are today is heartening and awesome. And it kind of speaks to what I've heard as a theme, leading with intention, recognizing what you don't know, what you, know, you need guidance on, and reaching out to people with disabilities. And so I guess I'm really transforming this into a question for the panel. Um, we know the employment rate of people with disabilities is staggeringly awful and continues to be. And I'm wondering, you know, based on your experience in the industry, based on your personal experience, what can we as, um, you know, an arts and film industry do better to get people with disabilities hired and employed? Um, and, and, and frankly, as Jim, I think you were said, leading some of these conversations at all levels. I could start if somebody, unless somebody else Go right ahead, has something Jim. they want to jump in on. Um, I think that we've seen some successful um, programs within the industry from companies saying we want to increase the number of uh, uh, filmmakers who are women or people from the LGBTQ community. We need those same kind of um, career opening um, uh, programs to address the disabled community. And, you know, that includes people who are new or diverse. It includes people who are deaf or, or hard of hearing or, or folks like myself who have mobility issues. But I, I, anytime you see anything that is saying, well, we are doing DEI, you know, diversity, inclusion, and, and equity, and if they're not talking about disability, then they're not doing that work. They simply aren't. At this day and age, for any organization to not include people with disabilities in this effort um, is doing harm. And it's doing harm because if you're excluding us, that says that we're not really that important, that this really doesn't matter. And uh, well, I could start you know, setting my hair on fire on that one. I'd like to quickly just say, you know, from my own experiences from different organizations and, and jobs, don't assume it could never work. Um, as someone who has multiple disabilities and multiple accommodations required to do my work, um, you know, I'm, I'm at Canon Companions for um, almost 14 years now, and it's been a learning process for sure, but I'm at a point where this whole work from home thing suddenly normalized the, f the fact that I was the only employee that sometimes worked from home. And that was a tough conversation to have with everyone in my community is that, hey, you want us to do better work as an organization that need to set us up for success to do that work. And that's what's happening now. I can't emphasize enough with service dogs, we see this all the time. It's like, oh, you can't work here because, I mean, we're a restaurant, it's a health code violation. Well, technically, no, it's, it, there are things in place that 
permit you to have a service dog in that kind of area. There just may be some kind of accommodation you need to figure out that doesn't violate a health code similar to, I don't remember who was talking about people who have allergies to dogs. It's, it's, it's all about asking the person with a disability and taking the time to try. And if it doesn't work, try something else. It's not one stop conversation. If the service animal is a problem the first time, let's talk about what the issue is and how we can move forward with another way to do that. And I think that's true in all industries, right? Um, so fun fact, October is National mm, Disability Employment Awareness Month. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of acronyms in the disability community, so I had to gather all of the letters together in the right order. Um, it's also known as NDEAM, so uh, great question about employment, and I think when we're putting out job descriptions and writing the quote-unquote ideal candidate, uh, it's important to put in the language that you are flexible about how people do their work or if they're working from home, um, the ways that you prefer communication. A lot of times there's language around um, verbal communication and like strong communication skills. And so if you're saying that, does that mean that you don't want a deaf person to apply for this job if you're only relying on verbal communication? Um, thinking about what has been done before and why why it can't be different um, and how you can be more creative. It's also really important to put um, benefit related information, compensation information on your job description. Um, that information is really important for lots of people, but especially disabled people who rely on a certain um, amount to be able to uh, have a certain quality of life. Um, and thinking about the disabled artists and creatives that I have worked with, a lot of the struggles are um, not so much that there's a lack of opportunity, but the, the foundational pieces are not accessible. So for a filmmaker to create a budget for their film or to put together these very basic things that everyone is expected to do to then deliver and apply for a grant or apply for a film festival. There's a lot of executive functioning that is required to do that. There's a lot of um, resources and skills that people are just assumed to have access to. But if you are a black, disabled, deaf, trans person, the access of resources that you might have are different from a white disabled person who has access and resources and connections in the film industry. So really thinking from the very beginning, how are we making these resources to get to these places more accessible? Um, and whether it is having mentorship opportunities and bringing disabled people into the conversation as early as possible. And if you don't have disabled people in your community that you know of or they haven't disclosed their disability, it doesn't mean that you haven't hired disabled people. I guarantee that you have. Um, but it's just a matter of whether they've disclosed. And um, going back to this idea of collective access and having everyone's needs met, um, while we are disabled and we have specific needs, I need a ramp to be able to access this room and this space. Um, but other people might have similar needs and really thinking about it from how can everyone be able to be successful in this space. And if you're thinking about jobs, what are traditional barriers? Is it that you have to have a bachelor's degree? Is that really necessary to execute the job skills that you are asking this person to do? Or would four or five years of experience or an internship plus lived experience also qualify? Um, so really thinking about some of these barriers that have traditionally kept people with disabilities from even thinking that they qualify or want to apply. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Rosemary, that's amazing. Yes. <laughs> I, I, agree, I wholeheartedly agree with all of that. I will also add that like, 
part of the the problems or barriers to access is like not communi not communicating and this communication thing both with the access that you have at your festival but hiring making it very clear that you are open to accommodating folks that you are open to accepting job applications from a variety of people making sure that you are posting jobs and working with local disability orgs that can repost your jobs and make sure that your jobs are seen um and i just would double down on what rosemary is saying is think of transferable skills i mean we this this applies to all marginalized communities right there are barriers to that folks, uh, folks face to education, to job experience, to transportation, to all kinds of things that won't, that make those checklists that we all think of with jobs uh, less accessible to folks. And so by being able to think of transferable skills, transferable knowledge, um, you know, I, I, you know, I often think about like, you know, film budgeting and, you know, there can be a single mother out there that has worked in film, never had a budget, but has managed the shit out of her personal budget and knows how to manage a tight budget and keep things on time. And she may be able to knock it out of the park more than some person that went to film school and just in theory knows how to manage a budget, but in practice has never done it. So I think that that helps with all kinds of access um, and all kinds of communities that we're talking about and just opening up our, our employment opportunities uh, for way more diversity in everything that we're talking about. It will only be a benefit. Um, to all of our organizations and just be clear, talk about it, say what you're able, what you're looking for, what you're open to accommodate and don't hide that information from people. I just wanted to add something really quickly um, is you can say that you want to hire disabled people, but if your work culture is inherently ableist, like we're not going to want to apply and work for you that's it um so really try to make sure that you're doing the internal work within your co company's culture because if i get an email from someone saying hi we're looking to hire a disabled person and i know that you've caused harm in the past or that your website is still not accessible or you're not willing to pay for the accommodations once that person is hired i'm not going to share that with the community because i'm not going to then vet for you as an organization if you can't put your money where your mouth is. So that's really important. If you say that you want to hire these groups of people, really mean it. I was just similar going to say that um, when you have on your website that you're open to hiring people with disabilities, different race, that you know, uh, special sentence that's on there, follow through. There's. Um, a lot of people that will put that sentence up there, but in consideration during the interview process. And again, once you actually get down to like two candidates and it's like, well, it would just be way easier to hire someone who doesn't require. So that'll save us some money and some time and staff training time. Please follow through because we have some great people in this community. You're looking at several of them um, and we, did, we deserve to have a place in your in your community as well. One thing that I've been trying to stress is that one's endurance is not does not equal value. Yeah. And that um, so often entry level positions of a PA or such is you're gonna have to do 16 hour days plus do the call sheet for tomorrow and then bring coffee in the morning. Not everybody can do that. And it doesn't mean that they're not dedicated. I mean, people are saying, well, if you're really dedicated, you'll be able to do this. You're filtering out and a number of people who will really bring something to the table for you. And I will also add that wouldn't we all want to work an eight hour, eight hour day on set and not a 16 hour day on set? Like, doesn't that accommodation potentially benefit your entire film team <laughs> and yes. not just one person? Um, and maybe you have to shoot a few extra days, but you have a much happier, safer set because of it? Yes. I have been on set and have looked at other people and I'm like, 
I'm, I'm going to take a five minute break. I'm going to go drink water and stretch. I don't know about y'all. Y'all can keep doing what you're doing, but I'm going to be over here. And they're like, well, that's a really great point. I should. I'm like, I don't know how y'all do this all the time. It's not sustainable. And if we're thinking about like how we're going to treat our bodies, like these bodies require a lot of work, whether you're disabled or not. And so making sure that you can keep up with doing the task, uh, no one should be working 16 hour days, in my opinion. Kibo, I don't wanna leave you out over here. Do you, <laughs> do you have something to add? Well, I mean, I, well, let me just say this. So I think I just wanna go back to Jim's point about, you know, if you're doing DEI and you're not thinking about accessibility, you're not doing DEI. I think there's an important thing for QuackMap, but I think also other, you know, the larger communities of color. Um, one thing that folks don't often talk about, like when we're hearing about um, police violence against our communities is they, they estimate about half or 50% of those encounters are with folks that are disabled. So we're talking disabled Native American folks, disabled black folks, disabled brown folks. And um, there's a, like a recent incident of a mother who was um, deaf driving her kids and was pulled over and um, it's a young black woman. And it was the, it escalated because the officer kept saying, well, she's not listening. And it's like, well, she's deaf, right? So I think that there's a piece there where if we're looking at disability and it's one in four in the general population, due to a number of factors, it might be actually higher within um, communities of color. And we don't talk about that very often. And then especially within queer and trans communities of colors, we identify a sick and disabled at a much higher rate than the general population for a number of reasons. And so that piece around equity, <laughs> I don't even talk about diversity and inclusion, but the piece around equity and justice and understanding the various barriers, under like centering disability also means that we end up, end up centering other communities as well. And I think that we often forget that because we see disability as something on the side versus understanding even how a 16 hour day on set can be disabling as well as the fact that we're living through a pandemic, which is a mass disabling event. Um, and I think we need to really think more broadly about how we're understanding disability within how we're working right now. We're good if you, are we wrapping it up? Do we have time for questions? Have we gone too long? Um, I th are there questions? I think it would be good to maybe wrap up and then yeah. if people, this space is, is open right now. So if people just want to hang out and still ask some questions. Uh, I do want to remind everybody to please put on their masks inside. I just had to remind myself as well, especially also if you're uh, approaching each other, approaching panelists. Um, I want to thank you all so much for this conversation. Let's give them a round of applause. One thing that I did realize that we didn't do is we, we didn't do visual descriptions when we started. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe we can, we can bookend it with some visual descriptions if you want to start on the end, Jim. Be happy to. And uh, before you leave, I've got postcards up here for the accessibility scorecard. I'd really appreciate it if people take a couple hand it to other people, oh. that'd be great. You can use that QR code to both sign up as a festival or fill out the scorecard yourself. Um, my visual description is uh, I'm an older white guy with longish curly hair with a mustache and a beard. And I have a white t-shirt that says FWD-DOC, which stands for Forward DOC, which is an organization that uh, was founded uh, by disabled documentary filmmakers and our allies. And we have over 600 members now. Uh, Rosemary, I am a light-skinned Japanese-American with my hair um, in a braid. I'm wearing a black dress, and I also have a service dog that you can't see, but he's behind the table. Um, his name is Dom, and he is working, although he would like to not be working. Um, so if you approach us, just make sure that uh, 
as much as Dom would love for you to say hello, um, he is needing to be on duty. And this is Wallace. Um, I am a 30 something, um, <laughs> 30 something uh, woman with a faux hawk, brown and some gray hair and uh, I wear glasses and I am sitting in a manual wheelchair wearing a blazer and a striped shirt. And I too have a service dog named Renata and she has been occasionally peering over the table that I'm sure you've noticed. <laughs> but if you approach us, um, please also not don't interact with Renata because she's trying really hard to focus on her job. And the last piece is that I am relying on an American Sign Language interpreter. So if you can wait until there's one person speaking so that my interpreter can help me, that would be fantastic. Kibo? Hi, <laughs> I'm Kibo. I am a medium brown skin uh, woman, cis woman of African and Native American descent. I am wearing a very buttery orange yellow shirt um, and a, a gray top over that. And I have glasses um, and that's me. Great, and I am Cassidy Diamond. I use she, her pronouns. I am a white 40-today-year-old um, uh, woman with short curly hair shaved on the sides um, and wearing a blue button-up shirt. Thank you all. All right, folks, thank you so much for your wisdom and, um, and teaching today. And we want to definitely wish Cassidy a happy birthday. Hey. Birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday, dear Cassidy. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. A cake just came down the aisle, and Cassidy blew them all out in one shot. Happy birthday, Cassidy. Thank you so much, folks. Kiva will uh, send you an email to wrap up with you. Thank you for being here.